morning of opening up God's Word and listening to what our great God has to say to us. So would you open up your Bibles to the book of 1 Samuel, and we're going to be in chapter 17 this morning. First Samuel chapter 17, hear the word of our God. Now the Philistines gathered their armies for battle, and they were gathered at Soko, which belongs to Judah, and encamped between Soko and Azekah and Ephes Damim. And Saul and the men of Israel were gathered and camped in the valley of Elah and drew up in line of battle against the Philistines. And the Philistines stood on the mountain on the one side, and Israel stood on the mountain on the other side with a valley between them. And there came out from the camp of the Philistines a champion named Goliath of Gath, whose height was six cubits and a span. He had a helmet of bronze on his head, and he was armed with a coat of mail, and the weight of that coat was 5,000 shekels of bronze. And he had bronze armor on his legs, and a javelin of bronze slung between his shoulders. The shaft of his spear was like a weaver's beam, and his spear's head weighed 600 shekels of iron. And his shield-bearer went before him. He stood and shouted to the ranks of Israel, Why have you come out to draw up for battle? Am I not a Philistine, and you are not servants of Saul? Choose a man for yourselves, and let him come down to me. If he is able to fight with me and kill me, then we will be your servants. But if I prevail against him and kill him, then you shall be our servants and serve us. And the Philistines said, I defy the ranks of Israel this day. Give me a man that we may fight together. When Saul and all Israel heard these words of the Philistine, they were dismayed and greatly afraid. Now David was the son of Ephaphrite of Bethlehem in Judah named Jesse, who had eight sons. In the days of Saul, the man, <clears throat> in the days of Saul, the man who was already old and advanced in years. The three oldest sons of Jesse had followed Saul to the battle. And the names of his three sons who went to battle were Eliab, the firstborn, and next to him Abinadab, and the third Shammah, and David was the youngest. The three eldest followed Saul, but David went back and forth from Saul to feed his father's sheep at Bethlehem. For forty days the Philistine came forward and took his stand morning and evening. And Jesse said to David his son, Take for your brothers an ephah of this parched grain and these ten loaves, and carry them quickly to the camp to your brothers. Also take these ten cheeses to the commander of their thousand. See if your brothers are well and bring some token from them. Now Saul and all, now Saul and they and all the men of Israel were in the valley of Elah fighting against the Philistines. And David rose early in the morning and left the sheep with a keeper and took the provisions and went, as Jesse had commanded him. And he came to the encampment as the host was going out to the battle line, shouting the war cry. And Israel and the Philistines drew up for battle army against army. And David left the things in charge of the keeper of the baggage and ran to the ranks and went and greeted his brothers. As he talked with them, behold, the champion, the Philistine of Gath, Goliath by name, came up out of the ranks of the Philistines and spoke the same words as before. And David heard him. All the men of Israel, when they saw the man, fled from him and were much afraid. And the men of Israel said, have you seen this man who has come up? Surely he has come up to defy Israel, and the king will enrich the man who kills him with great riches, and will give him his daughter and make his father's house free in Israel. And David said to the men who stood by him, What shall be done for the man who kills this Philistine and takes away the reproach from Israel? For who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the armies of the living God? And the people answered him in the same way, So shall it be done to the man who kills him. Now Eliab, his eldest brother, heard when he spoke to the men, and Eliab's anger was kindled against David, and he said, Why have you come down? And with whom have you left those few sheep in the wilderness? I know your presumption and the evil of your heart, for you have come down to see the battle. And David said, What have I done now? Was it not but a word? And he turned away from him toward another and spoke in the same way, and the people answered him again as before. And when the words that David spoke were heard, they repeated them before Saul, and he sent for him. And David said to Saul, Let no man's heart fail because of him. Your servant will go and fight with this Philistine. And Saul said to David, 
you are not able to go against this Philistine to fight with him, for you are but a youth, and he has been a man of war from his youth. But David said to Saul, your servant used to keep sheep for his father, and when there came a lion or a bear and took a lamb from the flock, I went after him and struck him and delivered it from delivered it out of his mouth. And if he rose against me, I caught him by his beard and struck him and killed him. Your servant has struck down both lions and bears, and this uncircumcised Philistine shall be like one of them, for he has defied the armies of the living God. And David said, The Lord who delivered me from the paw of the lion and from the paw of the bear will deliver me from the hand of this Philistine. And Saul said to David, Go, and the Lord be with you. Then Saul clothed David with his armor. He put a helmet of bronze on his head and clothed him with a coat of mail. And David strapped his sword over his armor, and he tried to go in vain, for he had not tested them. Then David said to Saul, I cannot go with these, for I have not tested them. So David put them off, and he took his staff in his hand and chose five smooth stones from the brook and put them in his shepherd's pouch. His sling was in his hand, and he approached the Philistine. And the Philistine moved forward and came near to David with his shield bearer in front of him. And when the Philistine looked and saw David, he disdained him, for he was but a youth, ruddy and handsome in appearance. And the Philistine said to David, Am I a dog that you come to me with sticks? And the Philistine cursed David by his gods. The Philistine said to David, Come to me and I will give your flesh to the birds of the air and to the beasts of the field. Then David said to the Philistine, You come to me with a sword and with a spear and with a javelin, but I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defied. This day the Lord will deliver you into my hand, and I will strike you down and cut off your head. I will give the dead bodies of the host of the Philistines this day to the birds of the air and to the wild beasts of the earth, that all the earth may know that there is a God in Israel." And that all this assembly may know that the Lord saves not with sword and spear, for the battle is the Lord's, and he will give you into our hand. When the Philistine arose and came and drew near to meet David, David ran quickly toward the battle line to meet the Philistine. And David put his hand in his bag and took out a stone and slung it and struck the Philistine on his forehead. The stone sank into his forehead and he fell on his face to the ground. So David prevailed over the Philistine with a sling and with a stone and struck the Philistine and killed him. There is no sword in the hand of David. Then David ran and stood over the Philistine and took his sword and drew it out of its sheath and killed him and cut off his head with it. When the Philistines saw that their champion was dead, they fled. And the men of Israel and Judah rose with a shout and pursued the Philistines as far as Gath and the gates of Ekron, so that the wounded Philistines fell on the way from Sharim, as far as Gath and Ekron, and the people of Israel came back from chasing the Philistines, and they plundered their camp, and David took the head of the Philistine and brought it to Jerusalem, but he put his armor in his tent. As soon as Saul saw David go out against the Philistine, he said to Abner, the commander of the army, Abner, whose son is this youth? And Abner said, as your soul lives, O king, I do not know. And the king said, inquire whose son the boy is. And as soon as David returned from the striking down of the Philistine, Abner took him and brought him before Saul with the head of the Philistine in his hand. And Saul said to him, Whose son are you, young man? And David answered, I am the son of your servant, Jesse, the Bethlehemite. Let's pray. Father, we have your word before us. We have read it, and we need your word. We need you to work in our hearts and change us. And so we pray, bless the reading and the preaching of your word now. Amen. So it's no secret that we have come to perhaps the greatest story in the Old Testament, perhaps the most well-known story. There are only a few other stories in the Old Testament that rival its popularity. We've got Jonah and the big fish. We've got Daniel and the lion's den. We've got Noah's ark and maybe the Exodus story. And so we need to begin this morning our study of 1 Samuel chapter 17 by by drilling down into the text. And we can drill down into the text by asking a a really simple question this morning. What's the point? What's the point of David and Goliath? Or we can put some more flesh on this question. Why, Why did God put this story of David and Goliath into our Bibles? And and how are we supposed to use this story? in our lives? Now, there are all sorts of answers to that question. 
just want to give you a couple different answers that are proposed. There's the, the facing the giants answer. So this movie was made back in the, the 2000s, and it tells a story about a pathetic football team and their, their pathetic head coach. And in this story, the, the pathetic football team and their pathetic coach finally take a moral stand in their lives. They finally own something, and then they face the giants in their lives and the giants on their football field. And so according to this interpretation, the call of the story of David and Goliath is that we as God's people need to face our fears. One popular Christian writer has written a whole book on David and Goliath, and he sums up the story like this. He says, like David, you know well the presence of Goliath. Your Goliath doesn't carry a sword or a shield. He brandishes blades of unemployment and abandonment or depression. Your giant doesn't parade up and down ancient hills. He, he prances through your office, your bedroom, your classroom. He brings bills you can't pay, addictions you can't resist, a, a past you can't shake, and a future you can't face. Are you ready to face your giants? Well, let David's story inspire you. So there's the, the facing the giants approach to reading this story. And there is... A lot of other approaches, but I, I found this approach rather interesting. If you've heard of the, the fellow by the name of Mac, Malcolm Gladwell, he's a, a Canadian, and he has this popular podcast called Revisionist History. And so he wrote a book on David and Goliath. And what he does is he goes back and he reads the story of David and Goliath, and he revises the history a bit. And, and so he asks a rather subversive question. He asks, was this battle a massive upset? And what he does throughout his book is argue that weakness and disadvantage aren't really that bad, and they aren't really that bad because what they do is cause us to innovate. They cause us to, to bring new ideas to the table. And so you see it in the story. David faced a superior foe, and if he fought Goliath on Goliath's own terms, what would happen to David? Well, David would become mincemeat. However, David's weakness forced David to innovate, which turned out to be his great strength and his ultimate victory. And so, according to this reading of the text, we are met with a call to embrace our weakness, embrace the, the disadvantages we might have, and use them for our own strength. And so the question we have to ask is, well, what's the point? Why did God put this story of David and Goliath in our Bibles, and how does God want us to make use of this Story And certainly we can say, as we think about these two different options I just presented to you, we can say, well, both of these options, they aren't evil. It's, it's a good thing to face your fears. It's a good thing to take courage and to stand up and, and finally do something, something that needs to be done. Even more, it's a good thing to be creative and innovative. It's a good thing to, to embrace the providences, even the hard providences that God puts in your life. We wouldn't argue with that. Those are all good things to do. But the question is, is that, is that what the David story, the David and Goliath story, really about? Is this story really about us and, and how we can take charge of our lives or, or maximize our lives? Or is it about something else? Well, the only way to find an answer to this question is to stick our noses into the Bible and look for an answer. And when we stick our noses into our Bibles and read 1 Samuel chapter 17 really closely, we find that this is a really odd story. So this story is known for the battle that take, takes place between, between David and Goliath. It's, it's known for the action. That's what we know it for. There's the sling in David's hand. There's the stone flying through the air. There's the stone hitting Goliath in the forehead, sinking into it, and David and Goliath falling over. What's odd is that the story, when you read it straight out of your Bible, just like we did, it gives very little air, very little attention to the actual events of the action. There's only four short verses devoted to the battle itself. Instead, what does the story focus our attention on? The story focuses our attention upon the dialogue, on all of the conversation happening between all of the characters. When you look at chapter 17 as a whole, it, it's mainly a, a dialogue with a bit of action and a bit of narrative description sprinkled in here and there throughout the chapter. The text is really keen to report to us as readers what was said. We hear from Goliath. We hear from the men of Israel. We hear from David's brother, Eliab. We hear from Saul. And ultimately, in this story, we hear from David 
himself. And so as readers, our job this morning is to pay attention to the conversations, to pay attention to what was said. So we're going to ask, well, what are these characters saying? What, what aren't they saying? And what does all of this conversation, what does all of this dialogue mean for us? And so chapter 17 can be broken up roughly into three sets of conversation, and that's how we're going to structure our exposition and work through the text. There's, first of all, a conversation between Goliath and Israel. Then second, there's a conversation between Israel and David. And finally, there is a conversation between Goliath and David. So let's stick our noses into the text and see what the point is of this story. So the first conversation, we've got Goliath, we've got Israel. And so the story begins by setting the stage. So we learn in the first few verses that both the Philistines and Israel have gathered and assembled for the purpose of war. And like many of the other conflicts we have witnessed in the book of 1 Samuel, the text tells us that there is this layout of the armies. The armies are on two heights. The Philistines are up on this height. And the Israelites are up on this height, and in between them there is a valley. And this is important to think about, because both armies can see what they're doing. Nothing is hidden from each other. And so the story moves us forward and wants us to ask the question, well, what does Israel see as they're looking out at the camp of the Philistines? Well, verse 4, there came out from the camp of the Philistines a champion named Goliath of Gath. And so with the emergence of this Goliath, this champion of the Philistines, the story does something really interesting. The story comes to a complete stop and gives us a full description of Goliath. His height, he's six cubits and a span. His helmet, it's, it's made of bronze. His coat of mail, it weighs 5,000 shekels. His leg armor is made of bronze. He has a great javelin and a spear like a weaver's beam. And, and the head of that spear weighs some 600 shekels. And what is the text doing? It's listing detail after detail after detail. This full description is given. And what's the takeaway? As readers, we say, well, that man is enormous. Even when we say, that man is a warrior, and as a warrior, he looks invincible. And the story is written in a way that we would get a feel for what Israel saw and felt that day when they first saw Goliath of Gath enter into the battlefield. And so there is Goliath before our eyes. The text has fixed our attention on him, and then Goliath speaks to us. And he begins his speech by taunting Israel. Verse 8, he says, Why have you come out to draw up for battle? Am I not a Philistine, and are you not the servants of Saul? And then Goliath sets a challenge before the people of God. And the challenge is this. It's a, a challenge of single combat. One fight will determine the whole war. Goliath says, Choose a man for yourselves and let him come down to me. If he is able to fight with me and kill me, then we will be your servants. But if I prevail against him and, and kill him, then you shall be our servants and serve us. So whoever wins this fight of single combat will win the war, and whoever loses will be the slaves of the victor. And then Goliath ends his speech by mocking Israel and Israel's God. Verse 10, I defy the ranks of Israel this day. Give me a man that we may fight together. Now, what we have to understand is what Goliath did here did not just happen once. It did not just happen twice, but it happened every day for 40 days, twice a day, morning and evening. This great man, this invincible warrior would step out from the battle lines and face Israel and taunt them with these words. So what happens? Well, this is supposed to be a conversation, isn't it? Goliath is calling out to Israel, and we ask his readers, well, do the people of God have anything to say to this man? Well, look at verse 11. What do we find in the text? When Saul and all Israel heard these words of the Philistine, they were dismayed and greatly terrified. 
we can just take a step back from this story and think. And as we think over this whole setup, this conversation we see taking place, it should deeply discourage us. And it should discourage us for a few reasons. First, we are again exposed to the cowardice of Saul in this text. The Philistines put forward their giant, but we, but we have to remember that, that the Israelites had a giant of their own. Their giant was Saul. We have to remember that Saul was a, a head and shoulders taller than any other man in Israel. Even more, Saul was one of the only two men in Israel equipped with actual weapons of war. And as we will read in this story, Saul actually has many of the weapons and armor that Goliath has. So what should Saul do? Well, Saul should meet this giant because he is Israel's giant. But what does Saul actually do? Does he shout back at Goliath? Does he curse the gods of the Philistines? Does he enter into single combat? No, he is dismayed and he is afraid. Second, we're discouraged because we are exposed to the faithlessness of Israel again. We have to remember who we are dealing with when we, when we think about Israel. These are God's people. These are God's people. They are the covenant children of God. They had the promises of God. Remember Genesis chapter 12, verse 3. This is what the Lord said to Abram and to all of Abram's descendants. I will bless those who bless you, and him who dishonors you I will curse. Even more, these people are the people of the Exodus story. They know the God of the Exodus. In fact, they had the songs of the Exodus story. They had the song of Moses. You remember this song that Israel sang by the edge of the sea after they watched the Lord triumph over Pharaoh and his whole host? Exodus chapter 15. Israel saying that the Lord is my strength and my song and he has become my salvation. The Lord is a man of war. The Lord is his name. And most importantly, these were a people who knew the Lord. The Lord dwelled with them and lived with them. They had his presence. But what does Israel do in this set of circumstances with the Goliath in front of him? Do, do they rehearse the promises of God and build each other up with that? Don't you remember what God said in Genesis chapter 12, verse 3? Do they go to the song of Moses and do they, they start singing these great words, the Lord is a man of war? Do they go to the Lord and commune with him to find strength? No. No, they're dismayed and they're terrified and they do none of these things. And so no one, not Saul, not Israel, answers Goliath. That's the first conversation. And we can move into the second conversation, the conversation between David and Israel. And so the words of Goliath just dominate the story. They dominate Israel. But all of this changes when David shows up. And so the story is very careful to explain the situation and circumstances of David's arrival. The three oldest sons of Jesse have followed Saul out to war, and David is left at home tending his father's sheep. And what David does is he travels back and forth between the sheep and Saul. And this is where the story picks us up. David is on one of his many journeys from the sheep to Saul. And he goes this time to carry provisions for his brothers. And so David makes it to the war camp, and he makes it to the war camp just in time to observe one of da Goliath's daily tauntings of Israel. And this is where the story starts to get really interesting. So Goliath emerges from the battle line, and he begins his, his speech. And what happens? Verse 24. All the men of Israel, when they saw the man, fled from him and were much afraid. So what do we... What do we see here? Well, we see Israel afraid. We, we know that. The text goes on, verse 25. They start to speak. And they say this, Have you seen this man who has come up? Surely he has come up to defy Israel, and the king will enrich the man who kills him with, with great riches and will give him his daughter and make his father's house free in Israel. But then the text turns to David, and what do we learn about David? Verse 23, And David heard him. 
And David does not only hear Goliath, but he begins to speak. Verse 26. He speaks to Israel. He asks, what shall be done for the man who kills the Philistine and takes away the reproach from Israel? For who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the armies of the living God? And again, we need to take a step back from the text and just think about David's words. What do we see here? Well, we see two matters. First, we see that David is a man filled with ambition. We have to understand that David is not a little boy. He is a man filled with ambition. Listen to the offer in front of him. What is offered David? A woman, riches, and a tax-free life. And David hears this. If you go conquer that Goliath, you will get a wife, the king's daughter. The king will enrich you, and he will free your father's house in Israel. And what happens to David's heart? He says, I want that. I really want that. But there's a second thing, and the second thing is more important than the first thing. We see in these words that David's heart is supremely concerned with the Lord. And we have to pay attention to the text. We're in chapter 17, and we're 26 verses into the text, and we haven't heard any mention about the Lord. Who is the first person to talk about God in the midst of this whole Goliath setting? It is David himself. And David sees this whole Goliath fiasco for what it is. It is a massive insult to the living God. But as the story moves on, we see that David is met with resistance. And who resists David? Well, it's the trowel and the proud who stand against this man of God. David must not only have to face Goliath, but he must face the tall and proud within Israel. Who meets him first? Well, it's his brother, Eliab, who is a tall man. And what does Eliab say to David? He says, you are presumptuous and your heart is full of evil. Then David has to meet Saul, and what Saul tries to do is he tries to throw this wet blanket of doubt over David's ambition and his zeal. But what happens to David? He does not heed either of these two men. He stands tall against these men of pride. And so what does he do? Well, he doubles down on his ambition and his zeal for the Lord. Look at verses 36 and 37. David says, Your servant has struck down both lions and bears, and this uncircumcised Philistine shall be like one of them, for he has defied the armies of the living God. David goes on, he says, The Lord who delivered me from the paw of the lion and from the paw of the bear will deliver me from the hand of the Philistine. And brothers and sisters, this scene, this conversation should deeply encourage us. We see Israel, they're frightened, they're dismayed, they're running away from Goliath. We see the tall and the, the strong and the proud of Israel. We see Eliab and Saul, and they're completely useless. But the text brings before us David. And what a refreshment this man is for our souls. He knows his God and he is zealous for his God's glory above all else. So we've got conversation number one. We've got Goliath in Israel. We've got conversation number two, David and Israel. And now we move into the heart of the story for the third conversation. Goliath and David speak to each other. Let's move down to verse 43. Goliath speaks first, and that's fitting because Goliath spoke first in this story. So Goliath speaks to David, and he says this, Am I a dog that you come to me with sticks? Am I a dog that you come to me with sticks? Goliath must have been really confused when David emerged onto the battlefield. This was a strange sight. Here is the champion of the Israelites. He comes clothed not in armor, He comes not with weapons of war, rather he is dressed like a shepherd and only has in his hands the tools of a shepherd. He has a staff and a sling. And this point should not be lost on us. David is not dressed like Goliath. David does not meet Goliath on his own terms. Nor is David dressed with Saul's armor. He is not a king like the nations. He is not a king like Saul. Rather, he comes to save Israel As a shepherd. So Goliath speaks again. Verse 44. Come to me. 
and I will give your flesh to the birds of the air and to the beasts of the fields. Menacing words from the giants. But here's the thing. These are the last words we ever hear from Goliath. Goliath's loud voice has dominated the storyline. His words have dominated Israel and have caused them to fear. But the text of Scripture refuses to give Goliath the last word. Rather, the last word is given to David, God's Messiah. And David shuts this giant up. And so David begins to speak. Verse 45. David says to the giant, You come to me with a sword and with a spear and with a javelin, but I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you defied. David's words are so helpful. Goliath's strength is what? Goliath hopes in swords and spears and shields and javelins. But David's strength is what? David doesn't list any weapons. Rather, he invokes the name of the God of Israel. David's strength is the God of Israel. David's strength is the very power of God. Verse 46, David says to the giant, This day the Lord will deliver you into my hand, and I will strike you down and cut off your head. And I will give the dead bodies of the host of the Philistines this day to the birds of the air and to the wild beasts of the fields. David's words are filled with faith, even in the presence of Goliath. David doesn't hedge his words. There isn't wavering in his voice. And as we read ahead, David's faith becomes reality. Not one of David's words fall to the ground incomplete. Just notice it. David said, the Lord will deliver you into my hand. And what happens? Well, David charges the battle line. He he launches a stone the giant falls face first. David said, I will strike you down and cut off your head. And and what happens? David runs to the giant and he he takes the giant's own sword and then he, he cuts off the head of Goliath. David said, I will give the dead bodies of the host of the Philistines this day to the birds of the air and to the wild beasts of the, the earth. And what happens? The Philistines see their champion dead, and they run. And the Philistines are routed, and their dead bodies litter the roads and pass all the way back to the hometown of Goliath, all the way back to Gath, providing plenty of food for both birds and beasts. But David isn't done yet speaking. He has one more thing to say. Verse 46, verse 47. This is the most important thing David has to say. He says this, that all the earth may know that there is a God in Israel and that all this assembly may know that the Lord saves not with sword and spear for the battle is the Lord's and he will give you into our hands. Did you hear what David said? This battle is not simply about blood and guts and gore. David, in this statement, is digging below the surface of this battle. David is saying this battle and what is going to take place is ultimately a revelation of God. And if you look with faith into this battle, you're actually going to see God revealed. David is saying this battle is a battle of theology. In the sling, in the stone, in the felling of Goliath, in the bloody decapitation, the Lord will reveal himself to the world. He shows the nations that he is Israel's God and that he has not abandoned or forsaken his people. He unveils his power and his majesty. He is not a God of wood or stone like the gods of the nations. No, he is a God who moves and lives and acts and can save. Even more, the Lord reveals himself to Israel. And what does the Lord do? He shows God's people in the midst of this battle, I am your all-sufficient Savior. I save, not swords, not spears, not shields. And so there we have the story. We have the conversations in front of us, and we've paid attention to all the conversations, all of the dialogue. We've listened to Goliath, we've listened to Israel in their fear, we listened to Iliab, we listened to Saul, and ultimately we listened to to David, and so we can ask our question again. What's the point? Why did, why did God put this story in the book? 
What does God want us to do with David and Goliath? How should it shape and change our lives? Well, here's the point. God put this story in the book for this reason, that we might look. That we might look. That's the whole point of the story of David and Goliath, that God's people would look. Do you get it? We are to look at Goliath. He is a vicious enemy. He is tall and strong and well-armed. He is invincible. He is the epitome of all that is wrong in the world. He is proud and he hates the Lord and he hates the Lord's people. He comes out to Israel and he taunts them and reviles them. He says, I defy the ranks of Israel. We are to look at Saul. We are to look at Israel. We look at Goliath and then we turn our attention to God's people and they are weak and they are helpless. They are cowardly. The giant shows up and challenges them and and they just run away in fear. We are to look at David, the Messiah, the Lord's anointed. He is a young shepherd. In his hands, he carries only the tools of a shepherd, a staff and a sling. His soul is full of faith in Yahweh, the God of Israel, and his heart burns for the glory of the Lord above all else. And in the face of his enemy, David shouts that all the earth may know that there is a God in Israel. And we are to look upon the battle, the great battle. The stone flies, the giant falls. David takes the sword and and cuts off the head of Goliath, and then he holds it up in the presence of God's people and the Philistines, victorious. The story is written, it's recorded and preserved for this reason that we as God's people would look upon the salvation of God, that we might see what God has done through his anointed, that we might see how the Messiah has saved God's people and given them rest from their enemies, that we might see God glorified in the presence of the nations, that we might see God as our all-sufficient Savior. Now that might seem like a letdown. The text doesn't call us to go fight our own Goliaths, the giants in our lives. The text doesn't call us to get resourceful and creative with our weaknesses and disadvantages. The story calls us to just look. Just look. And the story of David and Goliath brings us to the very heart of the Christian religion. Because brothers and sisters, the Christian religion is a religion of looking. This is what the gospel is all about. We look upon what someone else has done. We look upon the achievements of someone else. We rest upon the deeds of another man. That's what this whole story is about and what it prepares us for. In fact, every time the gospel is preached, we are called to look. The gospel calls us to look upon our enemy. There stands the great tyrant himself, Satan. He is a vicious murderer. He is an opponent of all that is good and true and beautiful. He is the very essence of darkness. He tempts us. He enslaves humanity. He destroys. He persecutes. He perverts. He resists. He rages. He rebels. And he daily goes out to the battle line just like Saul did. And he reviles God. And he puts humanity to fearful flight. And the gospel calls us not only to look upon our enemy, but look upon humanity. And when we speak of humanity, we have to speak of ourselves in this. We look upon our own weakness and our own helplessness, our own cowardice, our own fear. The giant appears and we, we run for our lives. But the gospel keeps preaching, and as the gospel keeps preaching, the gospel lifts us up because the gospel does not only call us to look at Goliath and humanity, but the gospel calls us to look at the Messiah, the Lord's anointed. And what a glorious vision the Messiah is because in the gospel we see the Son of God unveiled for us. And as we look at him, we see that he is pure and spotless. We look upon his soul and it is is full of faith. We look at his heart and it burns like a furnace for the name of the Lord of hosts. His armor is is not the armor of Goliath. Rather, his armor is the very spirit of his God. And the weapon that he carries isn't a sword or a spear or a javelin 
or even a sling. The weapon that he carries into the battle is this wooden beam upon his back. And the gospel presses us forward. The gospel bids us to look upon the great battle because the Messiah charges. And in the face of his enemy, he cries out, The battle is the Lord's and he will give you into my hands. The gospel tells us that Jesus went forward. That he suffered, he bled, he died, and that in his suffering, that in the spilling of his blood, that in his death, he won. He won. In the cross, Satan falls and God triumphs. Colossians chapter 2, verse 15. At the cross, Satan is decapitated and destroyed. 1 John chapter 3, verse 8. Jesus comes, he takes the very sword of evil, and he cuts off Satan's head, and he stands before God's people, and he says, I am the glorious victor. And what do we see? Well, at the cross, we see God's glory unveiled in the sight of the nations. At the cross, we find our all-sufficient Savior. At the cross, we are set free. And so we ask, well, what's the point of this story? Well, it's the point of the whole Christian religion to look, to look at the Messiah, to trust him, And what this story does is it calls us to engage in the most vital of all Christian practices, the Christian practice of looking, trusting, and believing what the Messiah has done for you. Let's pray. Oh, Father, we rejoice in this great gospel that you have given to us. We rejoice that you call us to look And live upon what Jesus has done. And so would you train our hearts to look at Jesus and to look only at Jesus. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, brothers and sisters, we get to partake of the Lord's Supper this morning. I would ask that the servers would come forward and